chatting, ed chat and things like that. It's, a, it's, it's quite shallow learning and often we're not pointing to the research. So the other really important thing that we've done is hooked up with the University of Bedfordshire, which again, free to use for educators. You can set up learning commu communities there linked in with academic research as well. So that's a really, really brilliant thing to have a go at. So finally, innovation isn't just about what we individually do, it's really very much about embedding what we do and making it part of our normal practice and that's what we're about. That's it, three minutes. <laughs> Um, well, first thing to say is I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this is the first uh, teach meet I've ever been involved in, and uh, I'm very impressed. I did say I was going to speak from here. Um, one of the things I have to say to you before we start is I've done some research um, on the venue. I did that this morning, and I found that between October 1940 and June 1941, within 100 yards of where we're sitting, there were six bombs dropped. Now, five of those bombs were high impact bombs and one was a parachute mine. And these are just the bombs we know about. So because of this, I'm wearing two pairs of underpants. <laughs> and I just want you to know, if you hear any ticking, right, we're off, all right? So I'm gonna talk about um, Sticking to the knitting. But before I do that, I just do a short poll. So I'd like you all to stand. Now, if you've got if you've got a whole school responsibility for learning and teaching, I'd like you to stay standing, please. Otherwise, sit down. Okay. So of those who are standing who've got a whole school responsibility for learning and teaching. Stay standing, please, if it's written in to your job description. But he's just, he's just discovered he's got a responsibility he didn't know he had. Stay standing, please, if it's written into your job description. Okay. For those of you who've got whole school responsibility for learning and teaching, it's written into your job description. Stay standing, please, if it appears in your job title. Okay. For those of you who've got a whole school responsibility for learning and teaching, it's written into your job description, it's part of your title, stay standing please if your school has a grieved definition of what great learning and teaching looks like that's been expressed and is written up and all staff know about it. <laughs> you see, it's a, really, it's a really difficult call. Thank you, just please take, it's a really difficult call to do your job when we haven't defined what that job might be. So, one of the things I'm finding in my visits to schools, and um, I've been to a few, is that people are do not stick to the knitting. They deviate from core purpose. They're swayed by initiatives and developments, some of their own choosing, some that others have imposed on them, and it's very hard to stay focused. So I've got five things that you need to do as a leadership team to stay focused. Stick to the knitting. Where does the phrase come from? It comes from the terrible knitters of Dent. Dent is a village that's near Sedbergh, which is in northwest of England. And in the 18th century, it became notorious because this was a village where men and women would knit all day long. They had a, a little waistband with a pouch a needle, and they would knit all day long because the knitting generated revenue so that they could stay alive. But in addition to the knitting, they would feed babies, they'd milk cows, 
they cheer sheep, they'd stir pots, but they always stuck to the knitting. Now your knitting, as far as I'm concerned, is to plan, deliver, evaluate, and improve quality learning experiences for every child that's in your care. Everything else is puff. Puff. You saw, you saw a statistic earlier about well-being and the difference between 2011 and 2012. Well, if you're not assessed on it, if you're not inspected on it, then it really is a test of how much you value it. How many of you are still doing pelts? See, it's a real test. Now, the first C of the five C's, core purpose. Core purpose. Define it. Revisit it. Publish it. Promote it. Harrow School for Infants, not only do they do this for staff, they share the self-development plan with the children. And the children write to the parents on how they're going to help staff, the adults, deliver a self-development plan. Right? Go public. Next, be clear, clarity on what great learning and teaching look like. If you're at Paddington Academy, you have the Paddington 10 plus 3, it's in every classroom. Ten features of great learning and teaching here at Paddington Academy. There's versions for it for children. Yes. If you go to Manual College in Gatehead, uh, St. John the Baptist School in Woking, you'll see this. So clear about what great learning looks and feels like. Next. Coherence across the piece. So this is like planning and challenging. What do we do collectively to plan great learning experiences? Is there a learning planner? that is based on principles of learning. Most lesson plans are elongated to-do lists. That's what they are. And we've been disinherited to some degree by the national strategies in this. So lesson planners that are based on how children learn. Next, so we've got core purpose, clarity, coherence, consistency. On a daily basis, can we do this? Can you do it on a daily basis? For your leadership team, have Five different leadership behaviors that you exhibit, you agree on, and every time you have a leadership meeting, challenge yourselves. To what extent are we doing this? Ask yourselves. And finally, community. Community underpins it all. Community is that bit where you feel you are doing something that is more significant than you as an individual or the organization itself. And schools do not trade in exam passes and SAT scores. They trade in hope. And every day that you turn up to work and you're part of that leadership team, you're doing that. So stick to the, knit the knitting. If you've ever been in your life to the Bridge Hotel in Newcastle on a Thursday night, you'll see a group of women sat in the corner knitting. They're there from about 7 o'clock to quarter past 10. Some of them drink pints. Some of them drink Earl Grey tea. But all night long, they do a number of things, but they knit. So my message to you, the five C's, stick to the knitting. Stick to the knitting and secure success. Thank you. do not trade in exam passes, Alice said, they trade in hope. I just think that's absolutely brilliant. And hopefully, I'm going to continue with that theme today. My name's Judith Enright. I'm deputy head teacher in charge of learning and teaching without a defined statement as to what that is just yet um, at Greenford High School in West London. And I've come to talk to you today about inspiring teachers. Why, why do we need to inspire teachers? We're in an interesting situation at the moment in the UK, and um, we heard from the SSAT earlier about this. 337,870 teachers have left the profession since 2003-04. If you just read the newspapers or listen to the radio, as we all do, you find out that we're trapped. We're the enemies of promise. We're accused of blighting children's futures, and we have this, this soft, bigotry of low expectations. I can see that all around me in this room at the moment. It's shocking stuff. It feels a bit like there's sort of somebody out to get us. You know, we're, we're, we're running away 
um, from the big bad wolf. We've got this tendency as teachers to undermark children's and ethnic minorities. We've been told that students won't get higher grades in their exams, even if we teach them better. Though, interestingly, yesterday, that seemed to be, Gove seemed to contradict himself on that. But also, we don't have a professional body anymore, and we don't need a professional qualification. Teaching's a craft. Anyone can just get up and teach. It's not a problem. And off the back of that, <laughs> we now don't have a particular pay scale, and head teachers are now going to be sort of given some sort of horrendous responsibility to decide how much each teacher in their school should be paid on the basis of how well they're teaching. But day to day, when we get up every morning, we're not trading in exam results, we're trading in hope, and we need to feel inspired. When we stand in front of a class of students, we need to feel inspired, and our students need to be inspired by us. So we thought about this, and this year at my school, we've got this program called Inspiring Teachers, and who are the inspiring teachers? Well, it's not just someone who has QTS, it's all of us who work with the young people in schools, the teaching assistants, the pastoral workers, anybody working in our school. And at the end of a busy day of teaching, we have two hour inset sessions on Tuesdays. I sat everybody down in the hall and rather than just kind of preach at them about the latest initiative or invention or description of outstanding, I showed them this. Oh, do we not have sound? Showing some really nice stuff. <laughs> Are we getting sound? Okay, he's good. We'll we'll start with him. Can we just go? Can we go back a little bit? Can you? Actually, can I do that? I think if I go forward now, I'm going to go back to him. Can you? Can you just take it back to? And we, we had a few more, but you get the idea. I've only got nine minutes. Um, and interestingly, this evolved, this idea for professional development in our school. It came partly, thanks very much to Ross, um, the night before, two nights before school started, he had a hashtag on Twitter, bad CPD. And not only was I seeing random people around the country tweeting about terrible things that were about to be inflicted on them by us on the first few days of term as part of CPD, I saw teachers from my own school <laughs> tweeting about this. <laughs> Well, there's nothing to make you paranoid like that. So I already had this slot, an hour per half term of one of these Tuesday two hours. Most of that time is spelt, spent within departments. Our middle leaders lead on training and development in our school. They lead on the quality of teaching, obviously, as we've discussed earlier tonight. But I had this hour per half term. I called it inspiring teachers. I did not have a scooby-doo what I was going to do with that time. Luckily, we have a little group in our school at the moment, it's called the Outstanding Teachers Group. It's a horrible name, um, but we can't really think of anything better. But these are the people who are very exciting in their classrooms. Two of them are here tonight, actually. They're brilliant within their own classrooms. They also are leaders within the school, and they share ideas. And so I asked them. I asked them how we should do this. We've got this time. What are we going to do? The video was an idea from the head of media. So we started with this nice video. We just asked students, you know, how does your teacher inspire you? And then we sort of broke it down. We've got about 150 teachers in the school, so 12 groups of 12 teachers. We decided that we wanted people to own it themselves. We wanted it to be something they were excited about. So they got to choose from 12 different topics, one that excited the most. And we had this sort of runaround idea um, at the beginning where literally I, we had no idea who was going to end up in which group. They chose a group uh, from the options that were available. And hopefully coming around to your tables, does it come around to your tables? You will see a little action research sheet. Sorry, I, I thought I was going to be sat at a little table this evening, so I had enough for some people around a little table. Here I am, hello. Um, so we got them then within their group, led by one particular teacher whose idea one of these things had been. 
So the ideas we've got there, experiential learning, feedback, reading, writing, lots of different things, some of which people are passionate about, some of which people have a paid teaching learning responsibility for, and they are there in part of the group. And people had to think about it, discuss it, get excited about it with a group of teachers from all across the school, and then they have to go away, and by January, our next one, they have to try something different and then blog about it. To be able to set this up in your own schools, you really need to know your teachers. You need to know what's happening in all of those classes. You need to know, as I happen to, that there's a fantastic RE teacher up on the second floor of D block. Nobody ever goes past her room normally, but inside her room, it is like you step into a different world every time you go into her class. And she is the one, she's also doing an MA um, on this, she is the one who is running this group called Experiential Learning. And what was so exciting about this was those teachers who normally you think, I can't teach them anything. I can't train them. They're absolutely brilliant. It was one of those teachers who came back to me. And you're looking at her, her plan that she wrote um, on that day as part of that session. She had no idea as well that this really exciting stuff was going on. She's a brilliant head of chemistry. The results are amazing. The students make great progress. They do really well in exams. There's nothing I can tell her about how to be an outstanding teacher. But she has gone away and got very excited about it. So I just want to leave you with that thought. How are you going to inspire your teachers and how can you get them involved in doing it? Thank you very much. Sorry. Go on, Nick. Is that what I got? Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, first one for me. For first one of these. I've loved it. I uh, didn't really know what I was putting myself up for this evening. S same as many of you, I think. But uh, really, really enjoyed it. I'm going to take you through. I'm really passionate about this. Doing it in three minutes is going to be hard, but I'm going to have a go. Um, Chiswick School. I've been there in my third year there now. Uh, when I started, I was the fifth head in six years. They are only starting to believe at the moment that I am going to stay. Um, so the first thing was actually getting people to, to, to actually come on board a little bit because there was genuinely a murmur in the staff room, how long will this one last? Um, a lot of time satisfactory, um, eight years satisfactory and you get used to being satisfactory and actually to go anywhere else people just didn't believe it was going to happen. Um, so we became good and that happened in March this year which was fantastic. Um, people sort of stood back for three or four days, everyone walked a little bit taller, um, it felt great. But then after that, there was this massive vacuum, because we focused everything at becoming good, and nobody had actually thought about what was next, including me, it has to be said. So 
the next bit was that we decided to get back to basics. There were one or two attempts to hijack it, it has to be said. There were one or two groups that thought, yeah, well, I know where we're going to take the school. We'll take it here or we'll take it there. So I had to fight a few people to actually grab my school back. Um, but uh, we decided that we were going to get back to basics and forget everything. And as Alistair says, get back to the nitty, get back to the bits that were important. So we asked the question of staff, what made me teach in the first place? And it broke down mostly into two categories. Either people had inspirational teaching somewhere in their life and wanted to emulate it, or, and the exact opposite with me, I don't think I ever met an inspirational teacher at school. They were all pretty rubbish. And I didn't want anybody to suffer that in, in under my watch. We came up with a set of moral drivers. I don't expect you to read them, but, but these are the things that make you come on a cold November morning when you've got a bit of a cold and you don't really fancy it and someone will cover my lesson and it'll be okay. But these were the things that were really important to the staff. And we also included the students in this, by the way, and said to the students, you know, what would make a good school for you? What are the moral drivers for you? And they're the things that we keep coming back to. With all the nonsense that's going on at the moment, those moral drivers are critical. So it's linking that purpose to a strategy, and we had to decide what strategy was. We came up with a corporate document. The document, even that word corporate was, was controversial. We're not corporate, we're a school. Um, well, corporate means everybody, so actually it's a corporate document. Three clear strands, making sure that teaching and learning is at the very heart. Creating an ethos, and that's going back to making the kids want to come in. If they don't want to come in, they don't feel safe, they don't want to be there, they won't do well. And the last one for us, because we're in mixed buildings, they're a bit messy in places, is making sure the buildings are fit for, for a purpose. And finally, we brought that down to departmental, brought it down to middle management level. The, the middle managers had to go away and had to write a three-year plan of what was outstanding for geography, for English, for science. And you know what? No one had ever asked them to do that before. They'd always been asked to do one-year plans. How will you get the next set of exam results to be better than this one? And I'm going to go before a kangaroo gets chucked at me.